This is a podcast from ComediansComedian.com. This is the Comedians Comedian Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stuart Goldsmith and today I'm bringing you a conversation as a comedian returns to the show, uh, having first taken part for about eight seconds uh, in uh, some sort of Christmas special jape many years ago. This is Michael Legg. So technically Michael Legg returns, but this is basically his first appearance. Uh, If you're not familiar with Michael's work, he is an absolute tornado of righteous anger wrapped inside a very cuddly Northern Irish man. Cuddly in the sense not uh, in reference to his entirely slim and average build but uh, he's just so warm he's just able to I mean he genuinely makes me laugh till I cry and he is just such a brilliant combination of wrath and warmth so without further ado recorded live at the objectively funny festival uh, just a week ago this is Michael Legg Uh, you will remember that some years ago, as a little Christmas special gag, I interviewed this man for 45 seconds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome returning to the show, Mr. Michael Legg. This is nice. Michael? It wasn't 45 seconds, by the way. Was it not? No, it was about two. It was, I just, I was, what did yeah, I say? Yeah, yeah. Did I say? Unless there's a director's cut that I don't know anything about. <laughs> That'd be lovely. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. This is Michael Legg. So you will be no stranger to this, uh, this room. Uh, th- genuinely, I ran a club here in 1991. 91? Yeah. That would make you almost 50. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost, almost. Yeah, yeah the, I, I started a club here um, because I really loved... Uh, Comedy? No, I want to bang someone. I, I, <laughs> it's true, she couldn't get gigs anywhere, and I went, well. Are you when, liber- when you say it out loud, it's the creepiest fucking thing that's ever yeah. happened, and I'm well aware that I should not have said that, but it's what I did, and I was young. I mean, it's a very nice. Okay, I, I feel like you have enough, uh, you have enough uh, currency in the he's actually a good guy bank to be able to mm-hmm. casually mm-hmm. refer. Mm-hmm. Oh, p- perhaps not. <laughs> and I, for people who uh, who don't know you i know i well, let's get into this in a minute let's get into <laughs> let's get into the remote possibility of someone in for yeah, example south korea not yeah, knowing who you are um, but so tell me tell me about the club that you started here this seems as good a well place it was a, it was in in improv uh, uh, club uh, it was called ad hoc because that suggests uh, this was pre-internet, so presumably you weren't aware that almost everyone. It was pre-entertainment. <laughs> uh, it was there was no such thing as happiness uh, or indeed joy. Uh, it was just a, a typical oh Stooges t-shirt, nice. It was just a typical. Sorry, I just pointed at the member of the audience who I now fancy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to start gigs here for you. Um, <laughs> Basically, uh, yeah, it was an improv show that you had like six people. In. But do you know, one of them, what, like, I started this gig basically to woo someone. But I got like Patrick Marber in it. I don't know how Patrick Marber, I remember, see the bar there. The last time I met, Patrick Marber and I did about 10 gigs together in this room. And I remember standing at that bar and he just goes, yeah, you know, I can't do next week. And I was like, oh, why not? I'm going, I'm going to Paris. Oh, you're going to Paris, are you? Go, what are you doing in Paris? Oh, no, I'm moving to Paris. I'm going to go over there and write a play. <laughs> well, he fucking did that, didn't he? <laughs> you're not supposed to... In comedy, you're not supposed to do the thing you say. Yeah. You're supposed to go, yeah, I'm writing a book. Of course you are. Come on, yeah, so, write a fucking book. How long had you been doing comedy pre-1991? Oh, no, your no, first, oh, no, 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 no. Listen, listen. <laughs> Let's get this very clear. <laughs> there is a massive difference between improvised comedy and comedy. <laughs> Okay, improvised comedy is an embarrassing poison. <laughs> it's it's the it's it's uh, you know sarcasm. It's clever and witty compared to improvised comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Murder is the second lowest form of wit. 
<laughs> improvised comedy being number one. And so let's define the terms here. By improvised comedy, are we? Do we imagine that you're asking members of the audience to shout th- out it suggestions? Was, it was me and th- 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 these other dicks thinking that we could in any way compete with like the comedy store players who are a slick, well-oiled machine. Okay. You know, they're just they they were born funny, and we. Uh, met in basically self-help groups. <laughs> Who uh, were the other dicks? Uh, oh fuck! I wish I could remember. Um, Neil Ashdown was one. Do you know Neil Ashdown? I don't think so, there no. you go. Do you know why? Oh fuck! Uh, Fred <laughs> Piss. He was in it. <laughs> I know Fred Pierce. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't know if you remember, he did that school shooting in the <laughs> mid nineties. Uh, very funny, though, I have to say, very funny shooting. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, yeah. So was this was this your first kind of comedy outing? Was yeah, the, yeah, was yeah. The oh, absolutely. The run- I, I went to I went to um, I'm so stupid. I, I almost said the word naive, but no, it's not naive. It's, it's just fucking stupid, isn't it? I saw uh, an ad in Time Out magazine in 1990 saying improvised comedy workshop, and I thought workshop meant a talk. And okay. I went thinking, oh, I'm going to learn. No, I I, I got, no, you have to get up stage and do it. And I went, like a wanker, I went, oh, I really like this. Because improvised comedy is brilliant to do. It's just the worst thing in the world to watch. <laughs> For anyone, anyone who has ever been at a bedside of a, of a loved one as they slip away, <laughs> you will know what it's like to watch improvised comedy. <laughs> Let me, let's try and paint a picture of the young Michael Legg, 1990, what, the, the, mm-hmm. Ma- the Michael Legg in mm-hmm. 1991, yeah. uh, who, you're in London? Yeah, I'm How in London. How long have you been uh, in London? This room was in London at the time. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. How long had you been in London? Uh, when I did my first improv class, uh, I, a, a year, a year. So I, uh, I was happily, completely alone for about a year. And then I got my first sort of Fight Club-esque self-help group. I've just remembered seeing a photo of you, a mm-hmm. black and white photo of you looking mm-hmm. young and cool standing outside the comedy store next to the Yeah, that's listings. right. No, I absolutely loved the comedy store. I didn't miss a comedy store player's show for a year. And honestly, not a single one for over a year. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, I went. I was obsessed with them. I loved them, especially Paul Merton, who was, is, to this day, I still think is one of the most naturally, like, just off the cuff, incredibly funny. And why had you, why had you moved to London? Was it to be... I wanted to bang someone. There's a lot... <laughs> there's... there's um, that's why I'm here. I want to bang someone. <laughs> You're one of the prettiest people on the circuit. I was hoping. <laughs> now, it's, I mean, it's really working. It's, I, mean, I am very yeah, much yeah, charmed. Yeah. So, okay, so prior to coming over here, who were you as a kid? In who was Northern I as Island? a kid? Yeah. Oh, sorry, what's the okay, rest and of the, the question? Thing, and and I'm, I'm just going to say something. You know, I said the three things to you before. Uh-huh. We start. The fourth thing, which I forgot, which I should have said, is that you're under no obligation to perform or try and be funny. Oh, it's, I never am. Even while doing gigs. <laughs> it's, it's their problem, not mine. <laughs> so... Clearly, we are going to have a lot of fun listening to you be hilarious about everything. You are sure, a very naturally sure, funny person. Sure, I've sure. been listening to loads of Do the Right Thing. Uh-huh. I saw your show this year, which I love, the Edinburgh Festival. That's Two years ago, I saw my, up until that point, favourite show of yours, Tell It oh, Like It Is, that's Steve. very kind of you. Which made me cry with laughter three times. Right. But we're not here to enjoy ourselves, Michael. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. We must uh, put aside such childish things. Uh, what was the question? So the question is, who were you as a kid? Were you obsessed with comedy as a kid? Were you a funny well, kid Well, I mean, I, I sort of had to be obsessed with comedy, really, because um, my parents, I'm the youngest of five kids, uh, my parents had four uh, children before they were 27, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The microphone may not have picked up a small wounded animal noise there from the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so 
uh, like when I, when I came along, uh, the, the, there's a two year gap between every one of my siblings, except me and my second sort of like, you know, youngest, I guess, uh, uh, sibling, which is the four year gap. Uh, my mum, trust me, my mum loves me more than the other kids, uh, like, <laughs> like by far, like she could still abort them. Because, well, I I am her absolute favourite. Whereas my dad will gladly, and he's 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 being honest. I mean, he's he's the one that tells the truth, and my mum doesn't. He goes, yeah, you were an accident. I was an accident. So I came up four years as opposed to the, the regimental two that they had. Got it. My mum tricked my dad. I don't know. Probably used a vagina on him or something. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there. Um, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but I, what I mean is, as a result of raising four children when you're so young, and by the time you're 30, you're exhausted with life. You, I mean, you're broken at 30. They had their fifth child, and they just went, oh, fuck's sake, switch the TV on, put them in front of it, there you go. And they got on with their life. As opposed to raising, I'm not saying that, you know, my parents don't love me. My dad tolerates me. My mum adores me. But... Uh, TV definitely raised me, um, it, which is why so many people, like my, my entire family, speak like this. They have the proper Northern Irish accent, and a lot of people think my accent has changed because I moved to London. Trust me, my dad, Brian Kant, had, <laughs> had an English accent, and that's why I speak the way I do. Okay, so was it always growing up? Was it always a, a dream of yours to live in London? Why? Why? No, no, no. I, in fact, if anything, I actually thought. Um, moving um, to the mainland to do anything other than take my country back was, <laughs> was a disgusting uh, act of cowardice. Um, so, <laughs> so, no, honestly, I, I find I had no interest in London at all, but I really did um, want to have sex with someone who had moved to London. So I thought, well, they're there. They're there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, um, and so, w mm. were you a happy kid? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Read. I mean, like, I, I, I don't. If you can have an idyllic childhood during the troubles, I definitely had it. <laughs> so, for a happy kid with a great relationship with a mum that loved them, yeah, and my dad. My dad's brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about, one of your your yeah. the flavours of your comedy, is a kind of howling anger. Hmm. Does that, Not picked up on it. Does that? Does I that, think that might be that subtext that even I don't get. <laughs> you are phenomenally good at being angry, at being funny angry. And I'm I, interested I, in how much of that is in your real oh, psyche and how much of it is oh a contrivance God. for the sake of... Comedy. Honestly, if you, if you met my mum, you would go, fucking hell. Michael Legg is basically a cover act because <laughs> she's the absolute real... I mean, howling will take you fucking down, anger machine. Uh, she, she, um, can I say this? Fuck it, I'm gonna say it because it fucking happened. Basically, a gunman walked into our house one day and she fucking stood and went, fuck off! And. <laughs> It's the first time I heard my mum swear. And it's a really weird thing for that to be the standout shock moment of when a mass gunman walks into your house. But, um, yeah. Mummy did a swear! Can't wait to tell Dad when he comes back on at 3.30 and points to a window. Can I ask why a gunman came to your house? Uh, sure, but I mean, I'll keep this very brief. My, um... My uh, my mum was involved in a group called the Peace People, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, you know an incredibly noble organisation. Um, basically, it, it, it did what it said on the tin. It just went, we'd like some peace now instead of all the fighting. Uh, but as a result, we would get th uh, threatening phone calls and stuff for the house, and uh, you know, and it, you know, well, it would. It's really hard to 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 make this sound good, but I'm not kidding you. I look back at the trouble really nostalgically. I genuinely do. I, they were really lovely. Do you know what? In those days, you could keep your front door open. I mean, a man with a gun would walk in. <laughs> but, 
what? You get to hear your mum say fuck off. And, and those were, Stuart, those were good days. <laughs> Uh, my my mum is uh, is a very like you know you know the way you've got well my mother was a very strong woman my mum would knock your fucking balls in um, and she would now and what uh, was the, what was the cause of that anger in her besides well, like, just trying to bring she, up her no, kids it, in no, a, no literally it's just injustice and it still is yeah. to this day like if you met my mum she's she's so she's in many ways, a typical uh, nearly 80-year-old woman, very sweet and all very adorable, and look at this thing I've baked and blah, 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 blah. Don't worry, it's vegan. That's how she is. But uh, if you just go, uh, well, do you know what? Uh, I think Thatcher actually had a few good points. Well, best luck to you, mate. I will back out of the room pretty fucking quickly because you're going to be taken down. She's she's um, a massive, massive lefty. Whereas, uh, you know, not everyone in Northern Ireland is. Okay. So it's that. So when you say you're a cover act for your mum, what's the, what's going on? What's really going on there? Is that an aspect? Like, do you have an, a social anger that you can unleash in society, I, or is that separate to what you do? On I stage? should point out, my mum doesn't know she's angry. She has absolutely no idea. She thinks she's sweet and adorable at all times, and she practically is. She has no idea that. I mean, you know, she she would gladly. Uh, Batter everyone. Put it this way: my mum is uh, my mum. My mum's nearly eighty now. So it was about three years ago. She was seventy-seven, and we sat together and we watched Avengers Assemble. Right? She's a seventy-seven-year-old woman watching Avengers Assemble, and at the end of the film, do you know what the first thing she said was? Finally, they got the Hulk right. Oh. <laughs> What a mum. Yep. <laughs> mm. Why would you, mum, find an, uh, something that goes furiously angry and green at the drop of a hat? <laughs> So to, so to what extent then is, is your anger a reflection of your mother's anger or like your, your performative uh, uh, anger on stage? It's Have definitely down to the, the, uh, my mum cannot abide bad manners. And as a result, I, I, I can't either. Like literally any unnecessary noise drives me fucking insane. And I get that all from her. So when you're, when were you first or did you remember an, an early routine in your stand up, which was... Which had anger? No, because you it. know what? Not none of my early stuff had it. No, uh, it, it's it's not until like the last ten ten. I mean, I'm, I've been doing it for like uh, twenty years, stand up. Well, nearly twenty years, and it wasn't until two thousand and eight I started writing a blog, and and the reason I wrote that blog was just to keep. I didn't even know it was called a blog then. I thought it was just an online diary. And I thought, oh, I'll keep an online diary because I'm going up to the Edinburgh Fringe. And I thought that would be a nice thing to look back on at some point. But I did know that other comedians had kept what I thought were called online diaries. I won't name the comedians. Uh, no one will. They're not doing that well. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, I'm pleased with that. But, um, but uh, every online diary that I read, I just went, this doesn't say anything to me about uh, about my life as a comedian. They're sort of like, oh yeah, I had to get up at eight uh, to get to the car, to get to the studio. And do you know what? Davina McCall was really lovely this morning. I just, who the fuck is this comedian? Where is the, where is the, oh I got up at eight, you know, with a hangover and just sat there and just did fuck all, all day. <laughs> didn't even watch TV. Just, I didn't even cry. That's how sad it was. <laughs> nothing happened. Literally nothing of any consequence happened. And your, that blog became very popular. It, with, blog, within like, the comedy, uh, or our comedy world. Yeah. And not just, not just comedians reading it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah, you, yeah. You started to gather a following then, that's kind yeah. of... Yeah. Well, I just thought it was a really funny idea to, to have a comedian that was completely um, unsupportive. Because uh, no one, no, on, uh, in the online world, I mean, now, obviously, everyone is a cunt on, online, but, but then everyone was like, look, I've had a cat for dinner. And here's a photograph of a cat on a dinner plate. And everyone was lovely and, you know, brilliant. Uh, and then I just thought, well, well, what if... I'm trying to remember reading it in context of the time. I think that, that's... I, I agree with you that a lot of what was on the internet was very positive and it was yeah, people sharing. But, but it was always people like, oh, my God, can't believe it, you know? I mean, I was walking down the street and someone 
someone asked for my autograph. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. You, you mean, mean you had to sign something? Is that what you mean? That Because that's not an autograph. Just because, you know, <laughs> fucking bailiffs were taking away your stuff. <laughs> but, but it was at a time... Yeah. It was at a time when comedians were very excited about the ability to bang on about themselves online. Of course and it was. You definitely of course cut, it was. You cut yeah. through that. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, uh, like I say, I'm not going to name names, but... There's five comedians who were all doing online diaries at the time, and within a week of my angry one, they all stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and as a treat for coming along to the live one, once we stop mm-hmm. recording, we're going to learn some names. So, <laughs> so, oh, believe me, I am not discreet. So, um, <laughs> I'm not indiscreet. So, um, so, uh, so, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely. Yeah, yeah, tell great. You. Yeah. So, uh, so let's get to. So, before we learn about the the anger working its way into your stand up, what was some of your early Stand up pre that period. It was all about um, making the audience happy and cheery and sort of hey. I, I was a compare, and I, and and I think uh, it, you know I was a good compare then. Um, uh, <laughs> Go on, let's, let's no. Stay I was on good that compare then. I, I you know, I, like I definitely got the room ready for an act, which I think is what a compare should do, as opposed to make the, the audience love them. And no one else, which is definitely what some compares uh, do, and you know, and and uh, uh, s- some people sort of see it as like, uh, well, just because they were better than you, no, that's not what it's about. It's definitely about um, getting the room ready for an act, and it it it, it feels slightly like. Well, I better get the living room clean for the, you know, the vicar coming round. But, uh, but, but that's only because that's exactly what it fucking is, you know. It's it's your job to make the room perfect. You can still be funny, and that's why so many people come up to you as a compare after the show and go, I don't know why you don't do comedy. Do you know what? I don't know why I'm not fucking nailing you in the eye. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but it was, but it was. So it was positive. The stand-up you were doing was broadly positive. It was about fucking boring. I mean, happy. it was. I mean, it was just. <laughs> Like, I mean, I, I, do you know the most negative thing that I can possibly think that I was doing in the early days was telling a genuinely true story. Get ready to leave. A genuinely true story <laughs> about how I played a practical joke on a girlfriend by when she was at work. I shat in a cat litter tray. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. She really genuinely thought the cat was really... A, what the fuck? I mean... And I thought it was really funny, and she, she booked a vet appointment. And then, and then, of course, it got to the point where, oh, hang on, something bad's going to happen to the cat, and I had to go, look, it was me. And you know what? I'm telling you this now, Stuart. No relationship survives that. <laughs> So this is Michael, really excited to get him on the show. Very much enjoyed this uh, lovely little bijou festivalette uh, recorded at the Albany in Great Portland Street in London. Um, And I'm on holiday at the moment, so I'm not going to talk to you for much longer uh, right now. I'm having the little post-Edinburgh decompression week that I would normally have directly after Edinburgh uh, that has been pushed forward uh, till now uh, as we go to Greece for my brother-in-law's wedding. So uh, not much from me. A quick thank you to everyone that's donated recently. A big thank you to everyone that's gone to comedianscomedian.com forward slash donate to support the show in a variety of ways and a big thank you to everyone that's done so by sharing it or giving it a five star on iTunes especially if that person does not live in the UK it's all the more use for me to get discovered elsewhere Um, if you'd like to join the Comedians Comedian Facebook group we can have a more in-depth conversation and I can recommend stuff to you and people can go on there and try and shift tickets for things uh, at face value or less that they are uh, no longer able to go to Um, so so we had a brief chat about that, which had something like 65 comments and people were overwhelmingly in favour of using the group for that. So uh, you might be able to pick up some last minute bargains on there. Um, but equally, I don't want it to purely become a destination for that. It is mostly an opportunity to find out who's coming up next. Uh, send me questions in advance and uh, communicate with me and the rest of the com community. You just can't not call them that, can you? So uh, details of the T-shirt uh frenzy coming up soon i've nearly said fiasco changed at the last minute um more t-shirts available throughout october when we get around to that but i'll give you all the details as and when and uh that's it for now i had someone sent me a really funny email but i can't find it so i'll have to leave it for another time thanks for everyone that got in touch to tell me that seven minutes is pathetic and thank you to everyone that got in touch to tell me that a seven minute run this is a reference to, to last week's post amble um 
to tell me that a seven minute run is terrible and I should do something with my life and those who patronised me in a gentle and warm way to tell me that hey it's not so bad many of us also can't run around um, I'm pleased to say the following day I did go out use my inhaler and managed to do 15 minutes before I ran out of time guys I just had other things to do I could have kept going I absolutely could anyway um, that will do for now let's return to the wonderful and like I said he's just like a lovely warm safe machine gun this is Michael Legg <laughs> I was expecting you when you said, "Oh, the pre pre the injection of anger into the material, pre that that, that discovery of that, the shaping of that voice, mm -hmm. that tone." I was expecting the example of of an early material to be somewhat more anodyne than a true story about you yeah. pranking a girlfriend by shooting yeah, a cat. Yeah. So I can imagine, <laughs> I can imagine laughing at that now with your current voice. Yeah, so, but I probably could re rewrite that. But but you know, I, I the way I wrote. It, it was like I, I can't quite remember but I I remember like it was basically like talking about bag puss and stuff like that you know it was all that sort of like uh, we all know bag puss and it was, it was you were about to say before it was boring yeah it was, was it boring, boring to you was it boring to you to do or is it just in yeah, retrospect yeah it was just shit I was ashamed of myself when I did it well, as you were doing Not, it. But, but weirdly I wasn't ashamed of myself when I was alone one day in a flat in High Wycombe <laughs> shitting into a cat literature <laughs> Like that, that doesn't shame me. I went, ha, ha, ha. Do you know what? You should always spice up a relationship. And what I've done is shat in a cat, cat litter tray. No, um, no. So I, I, yeah, but I was really ashamed of the jokes that I added to the terrible event of that day. 9-11 had actually happened. 9-11. 9-11. <laughs> Mm. So your two things happened that day. No, no, no. <laughs> so the the kind of the uh, the abandon with which you and we could all like we we absolutely oh get that's that's the word I was looking for I abandoned into the cat literature <laughs> I do apologise do you see what I mean the yeah. point like the way that you are able to improvise in a really like with in a really spirited definite kind of apparently mean it has a delicious quality like we're killing ourselves laughing now because you can riff on nine eleven while <laughs> shitting into a literature in a, in a way it was a bad day. <laughs> Yeah, Stuart, right, and right. I don't think you can make light of that day. So this, this you, this mm. version of you now, mm. talk to me about how that started to come into it. Just, it just happened when I uh, took... Uh, oh, I, actually, I can tell you what happened. I, uh, I, I saw a sketch comedy group that I was so jealous of that I went, I, I need to be better. And uh, I was jealous of their uh, their work on stage, but I was also jealous uh, jealous of their lesson. <laughs> I was uh, jealous of their. Um, I was just jealous that there was more than one of them. Do you know what I mean? There was it's it's a uh, sketch group called The Trap. Oh yeah, and, yeah, woo. And uh, there's three of them, and I was jealous that they had each other. And I was like, oh, I'd love to, you know. Uh, but back then, I, I, I didn't do... Uh, I, I hadn't had a solo hour around the gap, but just the idea of coming off stage and there was definitely another person, you know, in your group. I just thought, oh, God, that, was, that must be brilliant. And especially when their stuff was so funny. T to this day, I mean, I think they're pretty much the best act I've ever seen. So I was jealous of what they had, and I thought, well, I, can, I, I could probably easily keep on being as boring as I am uh, and then and, and, and dreading going to gigs and feeling unhappy on the way back Pr prior to that revelation why were you keeping gigging what was it in you that needed to keep gigging when you were dreading gigs um, I, I, I don't think there was a reason I genuinely don't think there was a reason I just think I thought I think I, I thought I was okay as a performer, but I knew I, I, by that stage in 2004, which is when I became, uh, when I, I'd seen the trap in 2003 and 2004, but it was really in 2004 when, when I just thought, well, this is what they're doing is what I want to do. And they're a sketch group and I am not. Uh, uh, but it's, it, but it was the, st it, it was the style and the substance. It was it, 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 like, like they were, 
they were making jokes that they sort of didn't give a fucking shit about. And something about that was just so utterly appealing. But well, mainly because they were really funny, but also it was like, we couldn't give a fuck if you don't buy into it and you don't find this funny. And they, I, I'm, I'm describing the trap really badly because it sounds like they're cunts, but um, <laughs> they, they sort of are. But I mean, uh, but, but they, you know, they do... They do eight minute long sketches based on like, you know, uh, like Patrick McNee doing a vocal on, you know, um, on uh, what's it called? Kinky Boots. And it's an eight minute long sketch, you know, and it's it, like not everyone's going to one know what that song is, know who Patrick McNee is or have the fucking patience for an eight minute long sketch. <laughs> and I did. And I, uh, and I absolutely, uh, you know, I saw them on stage and saw like, Paul Litchfield um, pissing himself night. I mean, literally, I mean, he wasn't pissing himself. He had a little thing in his pocket full of water, I assume, uh, <laughs> pissing himself every night because he was scared of chickens. And I went, just like this better. I like this better than, you know, whatever the hell it is I'm doing. So I guess after that, I, uh, I just decided, well, why don't I do other things to see if I can somewhat dip my toe into that? And The Trap and I, uh, uh, along with uh, Margaret K. Bourne Smith and Zoe Gardner, we did like some shows together, which just made me feel better about being a comedian. And I think I could justify doing the shit stand-up because I knew I was doing something else. So the, the something else was the shows with the, the track. The, the, sorry, those those were the the things. That and I liked. and so in those shows, what was that a sketch show that you were writing with them? What, yeah, what yeah, 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 that? yeah. It was. Uh, well, we started off with the uh, show called I don't know what the fuck it was called. I don't know. I'm sure we had a name for it. Uh, but it was funny. <laughs> so, so there was that. Uh, but also then we did uh, run a show called uh, the Real Daniel O'Donnell Show. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. yeah. In this room, that's right. Uh, so yeah, so gee, and all comes back to this room, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so you dis you were doing sketch shows there, and was that at the same time as you were blogging? Yeah, yeah. And my, I mean, we did. We, we brought the real Daniel O'Donnell show up to Edinburgh in two thousand eight, and that's when I started blogging. And in those blogs. Uh, early days I don't know what the fuck took over me but I just went I'm naming acts and I'm saying this shit and, and, and I don't mean that I Michael Lang the real human being I mean Stuart Lee the character yeah. right? <laughs> I mean um, I mean which is what I call my on stage character <laughs> no one else will call it that and it's really sad because I want to be as good as him but I do but, uh, but what I mean is the 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 the, I mean, the, I mean like, like, here's a really good example. Like, loads of comedians come up to me after this one blog gone, fucking hell, you just said, like, the most horrible thing about a, a fellow comedian. And I was really shocked that people were shocked. I mean, that, that comedians were shocked that they're not people. But, um, <laughs> but what I mean is, like, I was really surprised that anyone thought that I meant it. I just, okay. thought, I just thought, well, it's, I, th I thought it was pretty clear that, uh, you know, I was just fucking about. And it, do you know what it was? It was, it was, um, I just wrote a blog about working with Alistair Barry, who's a, a you know, a, 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 an excellent comedian, which is now me saying that will ruin what I'm about to say. Because I thought it was a really funny line. I just wrote, oh my God, I've just been watching the topical material of Alistair Barry. Absolutely amazing. It's like watching Have I Got News For You on Dave. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like I remember even Ed Burns saying I don't know I think if you said that about me I don't know if I'll ever speak to you again I was like God that's maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick but I just thought it was I thought the idea of just being horrible yeah. as a comedian to your contemporaries was just really funny because it because it was literally you don't do that it's up there with nicking material isn't it like you don't do that so I did it. <laughs> and how, uh, how was the fallout from that? Did, did Alistair have a problem with it, or was no, it other people? Not at all. Not at all. But a load of other comics did. Yeah, it was a bit weird. I mean, in, I mean in, that's literally... Elabor elaborate on how well, a bit I, weird it was. Well, did, you I, feel, did you feel that you had then done the wrong thing? Well, when, yeah, when I, d I did. I did for a bit. And that happens, and that does happen to me a lot. Like, when comedians get angry, then I just go, oh, God, have I done the wrong thing? But um, 
But I've never, I've never done the wrong thing, Stuart. <laughs> uh, no, it was, it was a joke, and it was, it was. The, but I guess the whole point of that blog. I mean, I didn't, I didn't mean for it to do anything. But I guess the whole point was, it's sort of. I remember a comedian do, doing a comment on blog, and they said exactly what I've been feeling anyway. They just went, "Why don't you do this?" as your actual material and not meaning these words mean why aren't you like this and, and, and I think what they meant was why aren't you funny on stage and I went yeah you're right so, so that's what happened so talk and that's why I'm that. now funny on stage <laughs> <laughs> and what, finish what a, <laughs> what a lovely story <laughs> so well talk to me about that that change because I think some of the most interesting moments in uh, in uh, comedy the development when an act changes when you go and I think it must be really hard to do to put the brakes on and go this isn't working for me I hate it I consider it boring well, and I hate myself I've got to try and do this there is a certain amount of a, there's a leap into the unknown there even if you can write the stuff down and make it hmm. funny there was it, it talk to me about those first few gigs when you started to use that voice on stage well it was it was scary but what I did was um, I went to um uh, I went to rooms so I thought I'd be really safe. Like, uh, uh, like um, there's uh, like, like Robin Ince was doing book club in this room, and uh, <laughs> I've, be I've basically lived here for about 25 years. <laughs> if anyone can point to the door, that'd be great. Um, uh, and, and so I do like, little spots there, and uh, and uh, oh, there was just various other little gigs going on that I just thought. Uh, might be a little bit easier to to to. Tr I don't even know if I was trying something out. I just thought, well, look, no one will see. So if I do it here, it doesn't really matter, does it? But uh, one thing I will say, uh, I've got an agent. Oh yeah, I've got an agent, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Places are <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm going. It doesn't matter. No, I, uh, I I've got. I've got an agent, uh, PBJ, Kate Haldane uh, is my agent, uh, and I guess we met six years ago, seven years ago, and she said to me, um, well, you've got to do a solo show in Edinburgh, and I went, no, uh, absolutely, adamantly, never going to do it, because I've got no interest in doing an hour-long show on my own. I'm not that interested, I'm not that into my stand-up. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know I can do it, but I'm just, I, I definitely wouldn't want to hear that for an hour. And then, but she was adamant and it turns out I really liked it because what I decided to do for that first Edinburgh show was scrap everything that I'd done you know, you know the golden rule of stand-up comedy is uh, you go up to Edinburgh on your first year and you do your best of and I went well my best of's fucking awful I just can't I, I would Hate. Is, is, is that because probably, is that because the best of was the stuff you were doing previously? Or yeah, is it, yeah, yeah. Your my okay. best of, you know, is and you know, ah, bag person. I did a shit in the kitty litter tray, um, but Emily loved him. <laughs> that is literally the punchline to the routine, but I can't remember the routine, okay. so therefore, it's of no value. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so... Um, so you threw everything out. So I threw everything out, and I thought... Uh, and I totally recommend that, by the way, to um, comedians. Just, just if, you, if you are going up to Edinburgh, I just chuck it all out and fucking start all over again. And, you know, um, uh, comedians also, they just go, oh, I'm going up to Edinburgh, but I've got nothing. That, that's... Uh, I'm, I'm up, what I mean is, they're not going to Edinburgh that year because they've got nothing. My, it's my biggest piece of advice. It doesn't matter. No one's got anything. Just fucking go up. It doesn't, okay. really, it doesn't really fucking matter if you haven't got anything. By July, you'll panic so much that you'll get something. That is a really yeah. good piece of advice. It's beautiful. I'm very, very learned. I'm forever <laughs> telling when people, because of the podcast, often get in touch and say, oh, how can I start being a comedian? And I always say that the only advice I can give is book yourself into a gig as soon as possible. Yeah. Panic about it. You know, think oh, about absolutely. it, worry about it. And then two days before, you will write five minutes of jokes because you absolutely have to. I think yeah. it's a really good kind of kickstart. I've, I've never done uh, an Edinburgh show that doesn't have uh, the final third uh, making its debut in Edinburgh. So talk to me about the writing process then, from the difference between that first one. How many hours have you done that? Five. So the difference between the, the writing process for the first one and Jerk, the most recent show, yeah. 
What? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just comfier with it. I think, I think I know, you know, uh, the shouty bloke better. So I just, well, I'm the shouty bloke by which you mean your persona, really? Yeah. Or I, the... uh, yeah, my mum character, apparently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what was the first one about? Did it have a theme? Yeah, it was about. Uh, it's, it's, they're all about the same thing, which is uh, just be fucking nice. It, it, but the first one was strictly about good manners. Uh, and it had the routine uh, that, that at the time sort of m- made me well it gave me a bit of confidence that I thought I Which could was do what? it what was that well routine? basically it, it was a New Year's Eve uh, and I was going from a gig in um, I don't know say it was fucking Richmond it doesn't really fucking matter uh, to um, to Te- Teddington I don't know <laughs> it was somewhere around there right just say A to B that's yeah. fine <laughs> so I uh, died on my arse at A so I was on my way to B now um, and uh, I was meeting up with friends for a New Year's Eve party and uh, there was uh, two kids I mean 15 year old kids on the train and they were smoking doobies whatever <laughs> uh, which might sound cool but believe me they do lead to problems so um, mainly me I was the problem <laughs> and I went over to them just went guys come on you know there's no smoking on trains and they were like this oh yeah sorry I was like oh well that was that was that was easy. And also they seem really nice guys. And was like, yeah, they you know what, they were fifteen, they're having a sneaky doobie, who cares, right? Uh, and I sat back down and they got up from their seat and moved to another part of the carriage. But it was like it was still as near to me as they were. And they lit up again and I just lost my fucking shit. <laughs> went over and just went uh, what did I fucking say? Imagine saying that. <laughs> Imagine being an adult and saying that to someone. What did I fucking say? Like I've got any authority at all. And then, uh, and then I said to, uh, I said to one, fucking, you know, fucking put that out now or something like that. And he just went, no. And I, just, I realised that I'd, uh, no, I asked him for his phone. That's why. Right, give me your fucking phone. Like I was, <laughs> right. And I just went, no, you're not getting my phone. And I realised I've lost all control, and I turned to the other one. Right, you give me your shoe. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a grown man said to a child. <laughs> yeah, and 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 because that happened, and I realised, so I went, oh, I see how you write comedy now. You just go, I wonder what would happen if I said this in real life. And then afterwards, you go back and go, well, this is what happened. And you just write some jokes around it. As as long as, you know, you've stepped far too far, I think you can get some jokes out of it. So so have you ever been in a position where you've thought, I've got nothing for the middle 20 of the show. Yeah. Uh, I'd better do something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, listen, I've got a great example of that. It was a show I did um, a few years ago. And um, the opening 20 happened like two, three weeks before Fringe. And it was a blessed fucking relief because I had nothing. I had maybe a half hour show. And what happened was um, I was walking down the street and some like teenagers on roller skates told me to get out of their way and I went I'm not going to get out of their way that's what I thought <laughs> I with, didn't, a, with a view to I just it. went there's loads of them there's only one of me let's see where this goes <laughs> instead of just being an adult and going mm, it doesn't matter I went no I'm going to see where this goes and it literally is my writing tool because they I refused to move then they sk- skated off the pavement onto the road and then they came back onto the pavement and come up behind me and circled me. And they were threatening me like fuck. And I was going, instead of going, oh, all right, I've gone too far, I was going, fuck you. I was literally threatening. To, I mean, I, I, obviously I'm not physically threatening, but, um, but uh, I just, in my head, I just went, I wonder what will happen if I don't back down. <laughs> and as fate would have it, a punchline was given to me by my own fucking stupidity. They were all wearing uh, roller skates, all of them. And at the end of it, when they were all being really aggressive, I just went, fuck you, National Express. To a- <laughs> right? And then I realized what I meant was, uh, you know, uh, Starlight, Starlight Express. Express. <laughs> 
And, and so, but, but the thing is, both phrases just confuse them. <laughs> so it's like, what? Oh, I meant Style Express. What? <laughs> and you've never, I mean, I mean, it was such a threatening place to be. And yet it was diffused by just being, like, unfortunately being an idiot. So I'm really glad I did it. It seems to me that a, a kind of a key component of your material, of your, your writing process, is the ability to really be honest about what a terrible person you are. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But do you know what I mean? Um, you're, I mean you're, not just afraid, say, uh, you're not afraid to mine your no, own awfulness, your but, own... But, I'm, but, but it's because I cannot bear people mining their own fucking brilliance. I just can't bear it. It's like, you, no one's brilliant. Gandhi, cunt. Everyone is shit. <laughs> he wore fucking curtains. He's, what the fuck is wrong with him? <laughs> And also, you know, if we really wanted peace, fucking put a gun in your hand, fucking sort of these things out. That's what my mum would do. <laughs> no, but what I mean is, it's like, no, I just can't... You know what? I'm not saying... Listen, we're lucky that we... Uh, that we know a load of really, really brilliant comedians who are really brilliant guys, but we definitely know some right fucking dickheads. <laughs> Keep recording. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I just... Uh, the idea of constantly bigging yourself up, or even bigging yourself up once, is just... How do you not hear yourself? So I, I, th I find it much... I, it's much more relatable to sort of go, guess how terrible I am. And is there any is there any cost to you? Like I'm thinking specifically of the the final part of Tell It Like It Is, Steve, where you talk about this awful moment of saying mm. to one of your rock, one of your musical heroes, yeah. and him hearing you yeah, as no, no. you. I, remember, I don't remember. Yeah, exactly. well, I mean, it's Steve Rothery. He was the guitarist from Marillion, which uh, oh, massive cheer for that. <laughs> and um, and I was in the front row. Row. It was like a gig, and I was right at the front in 1985 so I was 17 and uh, and when he was about to do a guitar solo I, I shouted really loudly not just in front of him of course but in front of anyone around me tell her like it is Steve <laughs> like it was some impassioned <laughs> bit of poetry when also when all, all it was was just country I mean it was just like this poor lad doesn't know how to be uh, so but the great thing about that was, um, it, it, it sort of flanked up. I'm going, oh, yeah, that, that is what I'm like. I mean, I didn't realise at the time. I realised much, much later, right? Yeah, I've got the ability to just be awful. And does it, does it cost you anything to admit that kind of stuff on stage? No, I don't are you think happy so. to sort of I don't think so. I think, I think it's much more likely the other way. I think the, the idea... Like, you know, comedians go on stage, go, do you know what? I was doing a gig the other night at the comedy store. And you go, why did you say that? Yeah. That's awful. Oh, did you die on your arse? Did you? Because if not, <laughs> I don't care. You know, I was on stage at the comedy store and uh, someone glassed me in the eye. Oh, brilliant. That's good. <laughs> no, that is a good story, actually. You know, I, I, just, I don't know why you're telling us this. I, I, I firmly believe this. There is no such thing as a successful comedian. There just isn't. I, I mean, you can be Jerry Seinfeld and have loads of money, but Seinfeld points out all his flaws brilliantly. Yeah, and, and the idea of success in comedy, I just don't think it's, there's a place for it. I mean, uh, I was about to say I might be wrong, but I've just thought about it. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> of, your, of your five Edinburgh shows, is there one that you feel you particularly nailed it? Is there one of which you're most I think, proud? I think, um, I think Tantler Like It Is, Steve's probably the best one, but it's not my favourite one. Did that have the Hunter story in it? No, I can't, can't before, really remember what that one was. Okay. I think that might have been the first one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? Might have been, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and is there... I was a hunter for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we won't, I've asked you to we'll kind of mm. repeat a lot of your material. We won't go into the hunter story. You're fa is your stuff available online? Or any of your no, no I've available? got no interest in anyone ever finding it or hearing it again. <laughs> well, I'm actually recording um, a jerk, my, my last show. Uh, I, I did record 
one of my shows years ago, I, was, I didn't even listen to it. I just fucking hated it so much. I, just, I didn't hate the show. I just hated the idea that there was a recording. It's just, well, I just I, so I've never listened to it to release it. But I am recording. Other people are recording it, so they'll do it all. And you know, I'm. So is there is there then that that idea of there's no such thing as a successful comedian? Does that hold you back in terms of your career, whereby you don't want oh, I to hold do myself? Things? No, I hold myself. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Because I just think, well, it's not what I would do, is it? You know, it's not... Um, and I think... Like, you can't really self-promote. You can't really... Well, like, I mean, like, like, I go on Twitter and go, guess what, I'm doing a gig. But to me, that's, that's like, you know... It's, that's more of a cry for help. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's rather, than, rather than, you know, it's not like a PR company's done that. It's me just going... Hi, yeah. But like, um, for example, in, in Edinburgh, like you've done the same room, you've done stand two mm, for a good lot of years on the bounce in a way mm. that I, I sort of fit. It's a great room, but I feel you could be doing bigger rooms and taking risks to get bigger crowds. Well, that, that's, and all the rest that is definitely the next step for next year. That's that's thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> that is definitely um, what's going to happen next year. And do you, but already you sort of feel a, like a bit more humble about that, like a bit like, yeah, oh, yeah. Like, it's not very you to try and be successful. Almost. Yeah, well, well, who cares? I mean, that's the main thing, isn't it? I mean, who cares? No, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's not for you to be successful. I'm asking if that's a thing that occurs to you. Um, yeah, definitely does. But also, but 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 I think ultimately, uh, the very fact that you talk about it publicly, like that, is, it's it's the most important thing. Like, who cares? Who cares? Stuart, I just asked you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about. Let's talk about fuck a thing. Oh, well, that's one of the classics. Maybe we should bring that back. Fuck a thing was... Uh, fuck a thing was so good. I had no interest yeah, but in you Twitter. Have, you have to understand, apart from you have to understand Twitter is so t different, right? If we explain fuck a thing really quick, cl really quickly, uh, I can't even say quickly, quickly. Um, fuck a thing is a, a thing that I put on Twitter years ago. I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, I don't know. And I just asked a very simple question, which was... Uh, if you had, had was always in capital letters, if you had to fuck A, and then you just come up with a, like a supermarket, <laughs> which one would it be, full stop, i go with Tesco's, she looks up for it. That would be, that yeah. would be it. <laughs> and the thing is, the replies would always be really funny. And like people would actually write proper fricking jokes to go along with this. And I was like, and all I had to do was retweet and retweet and retweet and lose followers. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I had to that do. That can't have made you lose followers. That was a brilliant oh, use of you. You are very wrong, my friend. The, I used to hemorrhage followers on those days. And the thing is, I would always say, by the way, if, this is, if, if you're not enjoying this, just mute me for about an hour. But people would just go, well, I'd just rather get rid of you. And what, one of the things I loved about it was that you would go, hey, Sunday, 4 p.m., let's play Fuck a Thing. And then you'd say that the previous day and everyone yeah. would kind of check in yeah. on time. It was really, really, it's really, really good fun. But then again, it got really popular, so I thought, well, let's just stop that. Well, this is it. <laughs> this is it. Mm. That's what I want to get to the heart of about you. Why is it? <laughs> Do you know how popular it got? Uh... Uh, someone from uh, Six Music, I don't know his name, uh, but he definitely does the breakfast show on Six Music, nicked it. Really? Yeah, fucking nicked it. For a toilet. I mean, he's probably a really nice bloke and someone else on his team nicked it for him. I mean, you can't put fuck a thing on the radio. <laughs> no, it was like, make sweet love to a thing or something like that. Ow. But it was like, so if you could make sweet love to a statue, which is a, a, a definitely one that I definitely used before. Oh, it's like, shame. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway. Okay, so leaving that issue aside, I do want, I want to get back to this idea that you... That idea of being too successful, like, I, oh, this is getting I too, am successful, too successful, I'll stop. Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that I would necessarily not open the door if opportunity knocked. Sure. Uh, but, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I think that, like, fuck, I, I really can't pin a lot of hopes on fuck a thing. <laughs> I, I mean, once CBeebies turned it down, I thought, well, where else can you go? Um... <laughs> 
but I do know what you mean. Like, like I did I this podcast for a while, and it and it got quite successful. It was called uh, Precious Little, and then I just went. There's, it's too many people like it. And I just why? Want to what is that? Why is it the two? I'm just saying. Well, like I think it, once it's popular, it's boring, though, isn't it? Why is that? Is that? Do you think that's reflected in the music that I you think like? You tend to like music that is. Do you know what I mean? Is, is, well, is it a similar thing to when you go? Oh, too many people are into this band now. I'm going to stop. But do you liking. not? Do you not think it's art? Is oh god! I've just said it now. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Do you Fire not think your confetti cannons now? Do you not think art is more interesting on uh, on its journey than its destination? So who gives a fuck? God, that was so... What I love, that was such classic Michael Legg. It was a genuinely profound thing with a bit of swearing in at the end in case, in case it felt too successful a thing to have said. Don't you think? Art is more... Uh, say that it's, again. It's, more, it's more interesting more, on its journey than its destination. Journey. Who cares? I mean, the destination's meaningless, right? Why, right? why do you say that? But, because once you're there, it's done. Right? So That's what destination means. That idea of the destination being boring, does you, do you think that holds you back? Like you said, you... I don't think it holds me back, because I, I, I don't think it's important. I just... It, how can something trivial hold you back? If you're not caring about it, you're not thinking about it, well, and it's not, it's, not, it's not for you, how can it possibly hold you back? So it's does, a bit like saying, you know, um, Michael Bay's Transformers is holding back my career. Do you know what? I've not seen it. I don't give a fuck about it. It's, it's of no consequence whatsoever. I don't, I don't hear good things about it. So does that mean you're happy as a comic because you're always on the destination? No. Or you're always no, travelling? No, no. And again, it's a bit like... It's, it's, it goes back to there's no such thing as a successful comedian. Of course, I'll never be happy as a comedian because the job itself needs... Uh, it definitely needs negativity, otherwise it just can't possibly exist. And is because that... what is there to, to hold a mirror up to? If there, if you, you can't hold a mirror up to joy. So does that let you off the hook to have to be happy if you've found a way in which you have to be unhappy for the job to work? What? <laughs> sorry, sorry. You if definitely need to repeat that. If you've found a job, if you've found a niche, a place in the right. world where you are celebrated for your anger and celebrated for your... and paid for <laughs> the... Yeah, most you, important part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you're, you know, if your job is to, to be unhappy, to be professionally unhappy, to be professionally <laughs> angry with yeah. things, does that kind of let you off the hook somehow oh. in terms of your no, emotional life? Do you, like, oh, no. I can't be too happy. No, but, he, too right, but here's, here, right, here's a really good example. Right, I think Do the Right Thing is the best thing I've ever done. It is brilliant. It is brilliant. It is brilliant, and uh, I do think something amazing is going to happen with Do the Right Thing. Like, it's going to You've be... You've shot a pilot. Uh, even that's n trivial compared to, I think, what's going to happen to Do the Right okay. Thing. I think something brilliant brilliant is going to happen to do the right thing. Of course, uh, the, the idea that I said this out loud might have dashed that already. But the, the thing about something like do the right thing, one, its success uh, and its, I hope, ongoing success will be something I will always accept uh, and, and indeed embrace. But more importantly, uh, I, it, the idea that we might sort of like do show after show after show of us began, oh, actually, we're quite successful now, so we've got nothing to complain about, is bullshit, because, do you know what? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it would be the most boring comedy show in the entire world if it was just... Well, who the fuck needs positivity? <laughs> it's just... A friend of mine recently, um, she, she's, she's been complaining about someone she knows about saying that... Um, uh, he gets angry at any negativity because you should only see the good and everything. But how the fuck can anything get done if you only see the good and stuff? How can any change happen? How can, do you know what? People aren't, but let, let, let's face it, my entire, if I've got a career, and it's definitely questionable whether or not I do, if I have a career, it's based around one, one thing. Switch your fucking boring mobile phones off. It's just fucking tedious. I don't want to hear your fucking noise on a train. That is it. 
But if I just accepted everyone was a cunt on a train, what is that ever going to change then? What, what, I tell you what will change, me. I will change. I will go, well, you have to accept it. No, I want the world to change because I'm perfect. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Legg. So that was Michael. Thank you to Michael. Thanks to everyone at the Objectively Funny Festival. Thanks to all the diehard ComCom crowd that came out. Uh, Hi Min was there. Dave from Australia was there. Uh, Andy McH was there and uh, plenty more people besides. And I also, before watching Michael, saw Sindhu V do a, a, a mini pre-hour uh, show at that comedy festival. And she's definitely one to look out for. So look out for Sindhu. If you see her name on a bill somewhere, she really made me laugh. So that will do for now. Hopefully next year I will uh, get a little bit more involved with a certain London podcast festival that I attended this year as a punter, but would love to attend as a as a podcaster. And they really seem to be doing it very differently to the LA Podfest, which I've been to a couple of times, um, which is a sort of wristband, get into everything conference centre affair. This was at King's Place in London, which is very nice, just next to the Guardian offices, don't you know? And um, and it, it, they've got some fabulous rooms where I, I saw a, 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 like a 200-seater uh, lovely full room watching The Bugle Live, which was tremendous fun with Anuvab Pal and Helen Zaltzman as the special guests, both of them very amusing, and the chance to shout, fuck you, Chris, in public. Um, but that was great, even though the room seemed like it would be more suited to a, a cello recital. It really worked for some... Uh, largely cricket-themed, news-based dicking about. So um, hopefully, if any of you saw me there, uh, I, I kind of made mild eye contact with a couple of people who looked like they might have been about to say hello and then didn't. And of course, one doesn't like to presume, so I didn't say hi in case they were just looking at me. So <laughs> um, so if that was you, then hey, hi, that was me. So uh, I'm not going to give you any more post ambling today because, as I said, I am on holiday. I hope you enjoy this one. Thank you very much to Daryl Smith uh, for all his sterling work thus far on the podcast. Uh, thank you to anyone else to thank well, Dan and Asher as ever. But um, I hope you enjoyed the Sashir episode. She is phenomenal. Coming up, over the next few. Tim McGarry, live at Belfast Comedy Festival. So do check in on that. You can have a Google of that. Belfast Comedy Festival in early October. And I'm going to be interviewing the star of Give My Head Peace, a seminal Northern Irish comedy sketch show, sort of their equivalent of Absolutely, I think, uh, if, if my uh, meanderings online are correct. And Tim McGarry is a very funny man indeed. So uh, come along to the Belfast Comedy Festival. And then when I get back and back into post-Edinburgh post-holiday mode, uh, it'll be writing day one soon. So I'll keep you posted on that as well. I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Is that how I'm signing off these days? TTFN. Mm -hmm.